Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rob Barnett from Bloomberg Intelligence, and I'd like to welcome you to today's BI Energy Exchange, where we talk about our research and the latest developments in energy markets. It's been a whirlwind of a week. We've got oil that's uh, pulled back quite a bit. We've still got European gas prices that are very elevated, so I think there's plenty to talk about today. One of the things that we put out over the course of this week is a survey that many of you participated in, and we had about 150 clients join us for a wide portfolio of questions about the future of energy. And one of those questions was whether the current gas crisis in Europe will shorten the shorten uh, the view of natural gas as a bridge fuel. And for that, I want to bring on Patricio Alvarez, who covers utilities and gas for us here in Europe, and get his response on what's going on and where we might be headed. Sure, Rob. I think um, the, um, the, the replies to, to our questions on, on natural gas um, sort of give – Give the pervasive view that that supports um, the, the the supportive pricing backdrop that we see for gas for the next few years, with with a, about 74 percent of the, our, our respondents um, disagreeing with the idea that elevated commodity prices will shorten um, natural gas's role as a bridge fuel towards uh, a more renewable future. Um, and I think this this dovetails well with with the current situation. We see this supply crunch, um, which seems to be spread across the globe, with with no uh, with no respite in, in sight um, in terms of uh, of bringing on uh, more more supply, especially in Europe. I think the the situation is uh, it's getting um, it's it's worsening day by day in terms of of how much uh, Russian gas supplies we're getting or, or how much we're getting squeezed in in, in that sense. Um, and then on the flip side, uh, if I may, uh, only 26% of our respondents believe that this, uh, this knee-jerk reaction in prices will actually shorten the, the lifespan of gas, uh, which means that they believe that we may be able to leapfrog into uh, a greener, low-emission future with, um, with less use of gas. And uh, if I may, I think th this is not... Um, this is something that that it's hard to to fathom, perhaps in, in the near term, given the situation in which we we seem to be in, where we we desperately seem to need more gas. Uh, but looking at at how things may uh, may evolve um, in the in the medium to longer term, um, the idea of, of of thinking that that we we may have hit hit uh, peak gas demand in Europe, I, I don't think it's far fetched at all. Because if we take a look at how long it would take uh, Europe to wean itself off uh, Russian gas supplies? Uh, there's really no um, no no quick answer. It may be uh, by mid-decade, maybe four to five years, and there's really no scenario where we see uh, that that level of those amounts of supplies that we got in 2021 fully replaced by them. So, which suggests strongly that there's going to be a demand response uh, that, that, that suggests that we will never have that those um, those peak 2021 gas demand levels. Yeah, I want to follow up on this note that you have, uh, Patricio. Very interesting set of analysis. For anyone listening, if you haven't seen it yet, you can find it on our natural gas dashboard or our electric utilities dashboard. But one question that you know, we've we've been fielding a lot is just how much the German economy might be affected if Russia essentially turned off the taps and, and stopped gas flows uh, in the second half of the year. So you've done a very interesting bit of analysis there. What would be the consequences of some kind of drastic step like that? Sure. So, um, in terms of, of the note, or, or where, uh, what we analyzed was uh, what was the potential shortfall um, or the size of that shortfall that Germany may face in terms of, of gas supply if Russia was to fully curtail gas flows um, after the planned outage of Nord Stream 1, um, which is upcoming in July 11th and is set to last for 11 days. So, our assumption is that gas flows do not return after that. And we do have to mention that the volumes leading up to that moment were very much suppressed. They're currently only at 40% capacity, which would still, uh, even if we got them back, would still demand 
um, significant levels of demand destruction. Our, our analysis based um, takes a ballpark figure uh, with um, with a baseline of 2021 demand and supply figures, and um, based on our calculation, we, we get on our calculations we get a shortfall of about 20 to 25 billion cubic meters, which represents a shortfall of about 27 percent versus 2021. Um, and given what the German regulator has stated um, that heating, um, heating, sorry, gas demand for heating will be prioritized, which means that the, the target to refill storage levels to 90 percent full by November will be prioritized over all other other sectors. And on the on the other hand, gas demand for uh, power generation can be um, substituted uh, significantly with coal and, and fuel oil in the near and medium term. We see. Um, the industrial sector, which accounts for about 40% of Germany's gas demand, as as being particularly exposed, and this is uh, this is has been already sort of um, described in Germany's uh, gas emergency plan, which contemplates um, when it, when it gets to a third level, it's currently at a second level, where where basically the regulator is incentivizing households and businesses to reduce or voluntarily reduce their gas use. If we go into the third level, then many things will happen. First of all, the regulator may uh, step in and start rationing gas supply directly so that the market sort of doesn't uh, go into disarray. This means that many companies will be freed of their uh, of their obligations to, to meet their, their contracted gas volumes with end customers. And uh, the other part, which is quite a big part of the, of the policy, is letting utilities pass through um, higher costs onto customers. Um, so, so we see that as the, uh, we're sort of uh, sadly approaching, or it seems to be that we're in that, heading into that direction. And um, our analysis suggests that that industry would, would be the one to, to bear the brunt of, of this demand destruction. One last question for you, Patricio, because I know you've got to run. We saw that Uniper is going at full speed to try to get an LNG import facility up and running by this winter. What do you make of that development? Do you think that there's a real chance of having LNG imports flowing into Germany this winter? So um, based on, on what we know so far, there's um, um, there's two uh, floating storage uh, regasification units planned um, by early 2023. One is operated by Uniper, and the other one will be operated by RWE. Both uh, both both floating vessels, um, sorry, both vessels have been charted already and are expected to to arrive um, to, to Germany soon. But the the part where we see some some sort of limitation is actually uh, creating the port solutions um, that that will the port infrastructure to allow for those volumes to be transported inland. And there's that, that presents the, the hurdle, the biggest hurdle, because that demands um, significant stretches of pipeline, um, which uh, looking at how the government seems to be uh, positioning itself to, to, to get that done, it seems plausible. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we do know that the German regulator has, has planned this whole emergency gas scenario based on the assumption that Germany can achieve 13 uh, billion cubic meters of regasification capacity by early 2023. And um, that's in the context of, you know, that's, that's still, if they achieve that, which seems ambitious, that would still be a drop in the bucket if you consider that Germany would lose about 58 uh, billion cubic meters that it received from Russia in 2021. So they will, they will only get about 13 BCM for LNG in a very, um, very optimistic scenario. And that's only that will only plug the gap, the gap that's about 60, 58 to 60 BCM. Okay, thank you, Patricio. For anyone who's not paying attention to their Bloomberg terminal, uh, just before we kicked off, there's a headline about renationalization of EDF potentially out there. So Patricio is going to go run, see what he can do. Uh, and so we'll keep the conversation going on here. Will Harris, I want to come to you. So one of the things that could be exacerbating the gas market in Europe right now is the potential strike action in uh, Norway. Now, I think they've got a resolution in place already, but 
tell us about what's going on there and how that plays into the gas dynamics we're seeing in Europe right now. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So it, it's quite simple, and, and we actually see this. Um, it's not uncommon in, in Norway for Norway's relatively powerful labor unions to threaten strike action, to disrupt um, supply, and, and, and of course, Norway's um, uh, chief um, revenue generator, which is oil and gas revenue. But, but this time is slightly different in that uh, there is an energy crisis uh, playing out in the background, and a relatively small contingent of um, union employees voted to strike uh, for a handful of, of fields, um, waited to gas as well, and threatened to ex ex expand and extend that strike uh, to encompass a lot more, uh, a lot, lot larger fields. So, so the initial volumes that were impacted were about 13% uh, of, of gas that, that, that Norway exports. And the, and the extended threat, which was uh, planned to go ahead this Saturday, was to encompass 60% of all of Norway's uh, gas uh, exports to, uh, to Europe. And, and so clearly, um, uh, against the backdrop of the energy crisis, I, I think it's not a stretch to say that the labor unions are, are um, using this as um, – Opportunity and, and leverage to to extract um, you know, better t better terms, better wa better wages for for their members. Um, but um, as, as you mentioned, a, a threat of a, uh, of such a, a large scale of production uh, amid this energy crisis uh, demanded the Norwegian government to step in, and it looks like they have um, mandated a uh, a resolution to occur because it is. Um, I, I, they said something to the effect of it is not acceptable for for labor unions to be disputing, um, you know, the energy security of, of, of the European Union at, at, at this time. So it looks like crisis averted for now, but it, it does underscore this um, this risk that, that goes on in the background of of um, Norway's oil labor um, uh, environment. Well, I want to follow up with you here and get your take on another question from our client survey. Roughly 20% of our customers said that they expect that the oil price by year end could be back above 140. That's Brent we're talking about. So what do you make of some of the more bullish calls in the oil market today? And what are you, the companies you cover, the European oil majors in particular, uh, how are they responding to this price environment? So we remain relatively bullish on, on oil. I, I think looking through some of the volatility in the last couple of days, which I, I, I think um, most have agreed that it is driven by, uh, by technical factors, um, the, the underlying fundamentals remain uh, directionally strong, uh, looks so even on supply recently, there's there's been strong signals on you know higher OSPs from from Aramco, uh, U.S. and Iran negotiations sort of you know fizzling out once again, um, and and then on top of that it, we have demand still climbing, and although there's some fears of recession, we still think this this market looks very tight, and um, and, and and fundamentally, uh, I I would agree that. That prices at the end of the year should remain significantly higher than where they are now, and and as for uh, the the global oil majors, it's really steady as she goes. There's 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 immense free cash generation uh, ongoing. We saw this in one Q. We're going to see it in two Q, and we're, I, I think we're just going to see another repeat of this free cash being deployed into shareholder returns, namely buyback programs, potentially dividend raises as well. Um, and, and also increasing um, uh, M&A, particularly for the Europeans uh, directed uh, in, in the energy transition space, we expect roughly 20% or a fifth of, uh, of overall CapEx this year for the European majors to be deployed into, into the energy transition. We do, we do not expect this boom in free cash to suddenly – be um, you know drive a, a material change in in capital deployment, which is uh, the sort of the the converse uh, outcome, which I think a lot might expect that that 
a boom in in free cash from 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 the oil and gas prices will would drive a you know a uh, a step change in in the oil and gas strategy, but we still see the Europeans, you know, steadily de-emphasizing oil growth to a lesser extent gas, but definitely oil um, as as they ramp up their um, their energy transition businesses and and particularly um, renewable power capacity. Well, I think there's a lot in the survey to come back to you on on some of this energy transition stuff. So hold tight. But first, I want to come over to Solly. Sally Elmaz, Senior Oil and Gas Analyst for BI. Uh, we've got a range of uh, projected outcomes that we surveyed, and there are a handful of bears out there. Are you aligned with Will? And there's a, there's a question from the chat that I'll just go ahead and ask you. What's your sense if Russian crude uh, – exports were to really be halted or curtailed significantly into Europe, you know, what does that do to the price? What's the worst case scenario when you think about the upside? Sure. So um, I certainly agree with Will on this. I think uh, the sell-off that we saw yesterday, I mean, it was, it was a notable sell-off that pushed the WTI price below $100 a barrel for both Brent and WTI that was a move of more than 8%, I believe, uh, which was on the back of uh, just wider recession fears, I think, uh, because we saw global equities and other commodities uh, fall as well. But um, I think we just need to remember that nothing on the fundamental side of uh, things actually changed. And actually, as Will mentioned, yesterday morning, what we heard was that Saudi Aramco was actually increasing its OSPs, its oil prices for August to Asia and to Europe. This is usually a good leading indicator uh, and gives us a sense of what Saudi Arabia thinks, uh, where demand might be uh, in the in the following month. So I think the risks for the crude market are still very much skewed to the upside. Uh, I mean, we're not changing our base case scenario for Brent for the end of the year, which is at $130 a barrel. Uh, we, we don't think, uh, which, which is very much based on fundamentals, uh, which are not really changing despite what happened uh, yesterday. And um, another scenario that we have is uh, the crunch scenario, which I think, again, uh, risk is very much skewed to the upside from the base than to the downside. And that crunch scenario, as you mentioned, I think one of the biggest risks is having more disruption to Russia um, and potentially having retaliatory cuts from Russia, especially if, uh, I mean, a price cap is something that we heard a lot about in the last couple of weeks. We don't know if this will be tried or executed, but if it were to be executed, there's a good chance that that could lead to retaliatory cuts by Russia, which would take off a lot more barrels from the market than I initially expected and, and, and compared to our base case scenario. So in that case, Look, I mean, the physical market is already flashing red. This is already a very tight market, and demand is coming back. Uh, and, I mean, mind you, the, in the first half of the year, demand was very much – demand growth was very much limited by the lockdowns in China, which could gradually be uh, lifted in the second half of the year. So we will have that marginal demand growth. And at the same time, instead of having uh, marginal supply growth to match that demand – if we get more supply disruptions, that would that would tighten the market even more, and I think the physical market would get even uh, even more tense. So, I think Russia is obviously the big unknown, uh, and there are a couple of big unknowns. I mean, when we look at the supply demand balance that we run, um, a lot of the parameters that we normally look at, on top of uh, the, the Russia uncertainty now, we're really looking at million barrel plus swings, which make forecasting things extremely challenging. But, uh, I mean, we, we try to use some assumptions and come up with some scenarios, uh, and those scenarios that we have, uh, we are not uh, updating just yet, just on the back of what happened yesterday. We remain, we remain uh, relatively bullish on, uh, on the oil market. Okay, Sally, two follow-up questions, both from our survey results. So one is we asked at what Brent price, do we get a meaningful demand disruption? And some people said it needs to go above 190, just 9%. We also asked our clients when they think 
global oil demand will peak. And we also asked what demand expectations were for this year. So I think demand is a pretty interesting piece of the equation. There's obviously a feedback loop with the price, but what do you make of the survey responses? How high do prices go before we get a material disruption in demand from a recession or other changes in behavior? I think this was one of the more interesting questions that we asked in the survey, and uh, most people said that it would be around the price of $150 a barrel uh, or uh, around that price to uh, trigger demand destruction that could take prices back down to around $100 a barrel or below. Um, I think one one thing to keep in mind with this is – Currently, uh, refining margins are so high, I mean, much higher than their historical averages, that the per barrel cost that consumers are feeling at the pump are already probably at more than $150 a barrel. So I think that uh, there might be a little bit more inelasticity on uh, how demand uh, responds to where prices are. But again, uh, that being said, yesterday we had this huge uh, sell-off in crude. So, uh, I mean, these, these might be changing in the next few months anyway. Um, but I think one another very important thing to keep in mind is, sure, I mean, it looks like demand will be a very important part of the equation. And we, it really could be the last left uh, remaining lever that could help rebalance the market. But we need to bear in mind that this is not a good long-term solution to rebalance the market. You can't just rely on demand to be destroyed so that we we go to more reasonable prices. I think obviously there's a mismatch between supply and demand, and the longer-term solution to this would be to ensure that we have more supply coming that is sustainable and that can help match that rising demand uh, to keep the market in, uh, in equilibrium. To the, to the other questions about uh, demand, uh, one was about uh, where people think demand might be this year, and actually now majority think that it will be below pre-pandemic level on average uh, this year, and that would be below about 100 million barrels per day. Um, this wasn't really the case last time we asked, but I think what's happened between last time we asked, which was November last year, and now is uh, the lockdowns in China, which obviously pulled back the demand growth uh, globally this year and, 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 and the estimates for, uh, for demand growth. Um, obviously, we, we're only halfway uh, through the year, so we don't really know uh, what the second half will hold in terms of demand, uh, but uh, almost certainly it will, be, uh, it will be a better demand outlook in the second half compared to uh, the first half. And the other one, always an interesting question, is when uh, our respondents think uh, oil demand might peak, and we, last year, and actually, uh, I think late 2020, when we asked, which was right, which was the survey that we had right after the pandemic, we had a huge increase in the number of people who said demand may actually peak before 2025. So that seems to be shifting. A lot less people now think that uh, we will see peak oil demand before 2025. But we actually have more people saying that it will peak before 2035. Uh, so, um, com- compared to the last last time we um, we asked uh, our clients, so this is a very, always a very interesting question because sentiment seems to be shifting, uh, and oil price and where oil price is seems to be a big factor of what people think. Uh, but we need to bear in mind also that uh, the peak oil demand question uh, is an interesting one. But even if oil demand peaks, we don't expect it to fall off. A- we expect it to remain at a plateau uh, for a few years before uh, perhaps falling. So, um, I, again, I, 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 these demand questions are always interesting, and, uh, um, and uh, yeah, th- those were the results from the last time. Okay, Will Harris, I want to come back to you. Along the lines of the demand question, we also asked when our customers think that EV sales will comprise more than 50% of new passenger vehicle sales. Results are pretty interesting. Obviously, there's a feedback loop to what demand could be. You want to talk us through that result? 
Yeah, thanks, Rob. So this result was probably the most surprising from from my standpoint. Um, I, there's there might be a little bit of a um, you know a, a survey bias um, g- given our respondents are are probably um, heavily like weighted to the oil industry. But but the the question we asked was when will electric vehicles become 50% or more of global new car sales. And the results showed a, a wide lack of consensus uh, for electric vehicle adoption. Um, we had roughly the same proportion of respondents believing that, that we would reach 50% of new car sales as EVs uh, by 2035 and 2040. So about roughly 40% thought 2035 and 40% thought 2040. Um, which, which is a relatively conservative view um, compared to uh, many forecasts uh, out there. Um, a small percentage of roughly 20% thought by 2030. I think that it's worth noting that global EV sales, including plug-in hybrids, are at roughly 10% uh, right now. So th- it's growing incredibly quickly. It, it was only at a couple of percent um, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so the rapid adoption of EVs is occurring. Now, it will take time to, to get to 50%. And, and, and I think even when you're looking at, at the oil demand component of, of, of this equation, of the, of the eventual impact, I think it's important to, to recognize that it's not just the, the percentage of car sales that, that's going to do it. It's going to be the percentage of the fleet where, where you're, you're going to start to see a, a material impact on demand. Passenger vehicle demand on, for oil is about roughly a quarter. Uh, it takes about at least 10 years for, for the, uh, the global car fleet to, to, to roll over, probably longer than that, 12 to 14. And, 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 and I just think that um, while, while this is occurring very quickly, the, the oil demand part of it will, will, will follow um, in, 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 the, in the years beyond. So BNF, our, our uh, sister um, organization department in, in Bloomberg, their global electric vehicle outlook has EV, global EV sales reaching 50% by the very early 2030s, so 2031, 2032, with both China and Europe attaining this, um, this milestone, uh, the earliest of any of the regions, 2026, 2027, and that's going to be followed shortly by the U.S. in 2030. So I think it's it's um, it's not controversial to say that uh, that, that this is that this adoption is happening very quickly. And if anything, some of the uh, some of the events that we're seeing at at the moment, you know, extreme volatility in in oil and and gasoline prices, if anything, is going to uh, uh, represent a driver to accelerate, not slow this trend. Well, one last question for you. From the survey, uh, you already mentioned that the European oil majors were allocating more of their capex to clean energy investment. One of the questions we asked is when our customers think it will be 50% or more. You want to walk through that and share what you think as well. Yes. Yeah, so this is a bit of a trick question because uh, because most of the EU majors have have sort of heavily suggested when they will hit 50, if not outright saying it, hit 50 percent of of total capex as as green or or transition. Uh, so so once again we had we have pretty wide con- wide consensus here. Um, by 2035 uh, was 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 the most favorite uh, a- answer. Uh, this is nearly half of re- respondents said that. Another sort of surprising result, once again, quite conservative pace uh, compared to our, our internal views and, and, I, and I think um, uh, street consensus as well. Uh, we, we have a, a, a couple of EU majors that have said that they intend to hit 50 percent or more in trans- transition businesses by 2030. So certainly by 2030, I think should be um, mostly the uh, where the most consistent with with what some management teams are saying, and, and I think just just once again, at, at the risk of repeating myself, the the boom in in oil and gas prices that we are seeing will not be and is not translating into higher capex into oil and gas uh, for for Europe's majors. 
uh, and instead is is having the opposite effect. It it, is, it will accelerate the transition. It will accelerate the strategies and in, and capital deployment into renewable power, into hydrogen, into electric vehicle charging networks, into battery storage, um, which it, which I know is, is sort of counterintuitive. But uh, but for these companies, particularly the European majors, which have limited or no exposure to the short cycle. Uh, unconventional reservoirs of, say, the Permian, like Exxon and Chevron do, it doesn't make much sense to be pumping cash into uh, long lead time projects, um, typically up offshore, when when they they already have their strategies laid out um, for gradually de-emphasizing uh, the oil weighting in their production mix, and to a lesser extent gas, and and ramping that. Um, the renewable uh, renewable power component. Thank you, Will. For anyone who wants to have a deeper discussion on this topic, a week from tomorrow, we're going to be doing a deep dive on the future of oil majors with some of our counterparts at Cowan. That's uh, a week from Thursday. So make sure to join us. I believe it's at this time. Uh, we'll put the link into the chat and we'll include it when we send out the replay as well. Solly, I want to come back to you for the last word. One of the other very interesting questions in my view was on the question of hydrogen. And I thought it was very telling that our customers overwhelmingly seemed to indicate that they thought batteries rather than hydrogen were going to have a more meaningful impact on energy markets this decade. Tell us what you think about that. Uh, yeah, I agree. This was a very interesting question and a very interesting result from it. Uh, actually, only 27% of the respondents thought that it would be hydrogen that has a more meaningful influence uh, compared to uh, battery technology in the next decade. And I think I mean, this, this kind of makes sense because uh, of the kind of the commercial availability that we have and, uh, and the better economics uh, that the battery technology has uh, compared to hydrogen at the moment. So the way we're looking at it is in the next decade or so, given these advantages, I think battery technology uh, will be a, a more uh, upfront uh, in terms of decarbonization efforts. But then hydrogen is obviously um, a very hot topic at the moment. I mean, we have been tracking uh, how many times it's being mentioned by oil companies in earnings calls, and there's been a significant uptick, especially since, 2000, since the beginning of 2020. So obviously management is co talking about it. The confidence seems to be growing, and there are certain applications uh, that where hydrogen makes a lot more sense, which is in heavy industries, things like uh, refine, refining chemicals, uh, some of the hard to decarbonize places where hydrogen can can make a lot of sense, and we are seeing a lot of big players like uh, Aramco in Saudi Arabia, Adnoc in the UAE, which are uh, committing to spend uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of money into uh, especially blue hydrogen and blue ammonia, and uh, using their uh, kind of supply chain and uh, and and the network that they have, especially with their clients in Asia, to ship those uh, blue ammonia uh, over there. So uh, there's definitely growing interest and uh, growing investment into hydrogen. So perhaps beyond uh, the next decade, uh, we will have hydrogen as a much bigger part of the energy mix. But for the next, uh, perhaps until 2030 or so, uh, the battery technology seems to be a lot, a lot um, better liked uh, by people in terms of the influence it will have uh, in the energy market. Okay, thank you, Sally. That's going to have to be the last word. We've got the last piece of a big hydrogen report that's going to come out tomorrow. Will, Sally, Patricio, myself, we've all been working on hydrogen, and we've partnered up with a lot of our colleagues in industrials and other components of BI to think about the hydrogen question, and two weeks from today, we'll be holding a, a webinar that goes deep on the topic of hydrogen. I hope you can join us for that. So next week, Future of Oil Majors with some counterparts at Cowan, and then the following week, we've got a very fun deep dive on hydrogen that levers 
uh, that will that will walk through some of the BI research. So I hope everyone has a great week and feel free to reach out to any of us with questions or comments. Thank you for your time.